Hello friends, welcome to another video on my series on serotonin. Today we'll be discussing some interesting subjects. First, we'll be discussing the confusing role of serotonin on intelligence and on cognition. Before we discuss the meat of the subject, which is serotonin's modulation of neurogenesis, which is the growth of new neurons in the brain. Let's get started with the other stuff first, get it out of the way. So first of all, uh, regarding intelligence, higher CERT activity in the midbrain in humans is associated with higher IQ. H CERT, remember, is the serotonin transporter that takes serotonin out of the synaptic cleft. Uh, I will try to avoid analyzing these results of research on this discussion because they are not straightforward. They, uh, the real answer is we don't really know exactly how serotonin influences intelligence and we don't really know how it influences cognition except that it probably very low serotonin levels harm cognition and very high levels probably harm condition, uh, cognition. But we don't know the exact details. I'm just going to summar summarize some interesting results of the research. One other thing, which is this is maybe the least relevant thing, which is that discordant amounts of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and serotonin in men are associated with uh, higher emotional IQ uh, uh, results, which means having high BDNF activity and low serotonergic activity is associated with better emotional intelligence, and having low BDNF activity and higher serotonin activity is also associated with better emotional intelligence in men. But why? We have no idea. There's a polymorphism in the 5-HT2A receptor gene, which is called uh, HTR2A, which means HT is serotonin, so and then receptor 2A. Anyway, there's a polymorphism at RS6311 that is associated significantly with uh, IQ in people, in children with ADHD. And it is also, the effect is increased by polymorphisms at the HTTSTIN to VNTR transporter region. We're not gonna, this, I'm just listing some results of the research. So another thing that we know is that there is, maybe this should belong in the second section, the cognition section, but um, there's a negative association between serotonin levels and vocabulary scores in uh, healthy adults, which means that higher serotonergic, higher serotonergic activity seems to worsen uh, vocabulary scores which may mean that there is some influence on memory but again I was, I'm gonna try not to analyze this stuff because it's it's not very straightforward. Um, the influence of serotonin on cognition has definitely confused researchers for many decades. Early studies showed that having too little serotonin or too high serotonin in rodents seemed to harm cognition. Um, tryptophan depletion studies in um, Tryptophan depletion studies in rodents harmed object uh, memory recognition, object recognition, which seems to indicate that uh, low, very low serotonin levels harmed rodents. However, uh, and also a uh, knockout of the tryptophan hydroxylase 2 uh, gene in rodents, um, it, it enhanced, so this is not very clear, but it enhanced fear learning. Now, this part of learning, but really it's the part of learning that drives the development of like uh, symptoms of PTSD. So when you're anxious, fear learning is the uh, learning to be averse to negative stimuli. But anyway, uh, it, it was enhanced without the TPH2 uh, gene, which means that the rodents had less synthesis of serotonin, so they became more fearful of um, averse stim or uh, more averse to negative stimuli. Um, 5-HT1A agonists improve memory, but only in the depressed and anxious adults. I mean, uh, only in depressed and anxious people, but not in healthy volunteers. This is a little confusing because in the short term, in the acute sense, 5-HT1A agonism would cause a reduction in serotonin synthesis and therefore probably reduce serotonergic activity in general, especially if it's presynaptic. But in an, a chronic sense, this causes neurogenesis. So it's unclear what it exactly does. And then even in the short term, if it causes neurogenesis, that could cause a slight decline in, uh, in cognition. In this case, the agonists improve memory, but it, it could cause, I've noticed that when someone has a lot of neurotrophic factors, they sometimes experience a slight amount of brain fog. Anyway, uh, serotonin also, I just want to make a note, you'll remember this from the receptor episode, but serotonin does modulate the cholinergic uh, function in the brain. Uh, changing acetylcholine levels and acetylcholine is strongly associated with memory and learning. So finally, we get into the meat of the subject. How does serotonin influence neurogenesis? This is 
and very important and is the reason why I am personally interested in serotonin and is the actually the, the there are other reasons to take an SSRI and maybe I would have considered them but I highly doubt I would have taken one had it not been for the neurogenesis so this is the meat of the subject first of all serotonin is established as a positive regulatory factor for neurogenesis in adults serotonin serotonergic activity increases neurotrophic factors in the brain not just one but several okay but we're, we're gonna call it neurogenesis but it also some SSRIs, uh, we'll talk about this later, but some of them also inc increase oligodendrogenesis, uh, which is the creation of new oligodendrocytes, which are the parts of the brain that uh, produce myelin, which sheathes the axons of the brain. Remember those tentacles that send serotonin to the front and the back? Those are what get uh, basically the pathology of ALS, which is what um, Stephen Hawking had, is that those axons, the myelin, uh, deteriorates and the person is not producing enough myelin so now you may think okay I don't have uh, ALS how does this matter to me well polymorphisms at myelin producing genes or related think genes that are related to myelin strongly influence intelligence and it seems that the more myelin you produce the better your brain functions so SSRIs also increase that so it's not just the birth of new neurons in fact I should mention briefly the issue with the birth of new neurons so we talked about the new this in the neurodegenerative section a little bit but as people age they lose neurons this forms a big part of their cognitive decline but in the adult neurogenesis it was originally thought that adults cannot grow new neurons for a long time that was thought then it was discovered that adults can grow new neurons in two areas of the brain the dentate gyrus and the SVZ the subventricular zone in those two areas the adults can grow new neurons at a slower rate than children but these new neurons can grow they can then uh, differentiate which means become a certain cell type and then they can uh, be sent to uh, uh, proliferate in the brain so they can move to different areas so for example you could be needing neurons in your nucleus accumbens and it, it, it's possible that your dentate gyrus or SVZ may produce a neuron which then may travel to that area, differentiate and travel into that area and become a neuron for that purpose. So for example, imagine you have lost serotonergic neurons in your RAF nucle uh, nucleus. It is possible, we're not completely, there's no evidence of it, but it's possible that your brain in adulthood may, if, especially if you're using a lot of these factors, uh, may increase neurogenesis and that neuron may travel to that area may uh, differentiate into a serotonergic neuron and may travel to the RAF uh, nucleus and produce serotonin there so essentially this is a way of rehabilitating the brain and potentially increasing the intelligence of the brain if you really think about it because brain size is associated strongly with intelligence strongly this is not debate this has been known for a very long time head size and brain mass are associated with intelligence strongly which means literally that I'm sorry guys I'm having some technical difficulties what I was trying to say was that even the brain mass and the head size is associated with intelligence so that's actually literally the amount of neurons someone has that's what composes most of the brain size I mean that at least the the consistent structure the structural difference between smaller and larger brains um, other than anyway so the point is um, increasing neuron development especially as we age but in general may be attractive to people now um, so I wanted to mention so let's talk about neurogenesis first of all we know uh, conclusively that tryptophan depletion as well as um, deprivation of serotonin innervation in the brain decreases neurogenesis uh, we know that estrogens role in modulating neurogenesis in the brain occurs via estrogens modulation of serotonin which is something very uh, substantial and evident in the research now estrogen also modulates neuroplasticity via other means that are that are serotonin independent neuroplasticity by the way means the ability of your brain to reorganize which directly happens because of neurogenesis when you get new neurons your brain has to reorganize but there are other factors involved slightly in that as well so in the case of estrogen there's something called, sorry, my dog is getting excited. There's something called uh, PSANCAM, uh, which is an expression that is altered by estrogen that affects, for example, neuroplasticity. Now, let me tell you about the research of studies on rodents on this subject. First of all, I wrote some notes here. We're going to go first with the dentate gyrus and then go to the subventricular area of the, of the brain. In the dentate gyrus, okay, 
Agonism, I'm going to tell you about the different receptors and agonizing them and antagonizing them and what the results are, or the, or the most notable results. First of all, agonizing the 5-HT1A receptor increases neurogenesis in the uh, dente gyrus of rodents by 51%. This is crazy, huh? Uh, antagonism of it reduces neurogenesis of the 5-HT1A receptor. Remember, this is the autoreceptor in the presynaptic area and the one that's thought to be targeted, uh, that's, that's agonism is thought to be the most relevant to SSRI's effect on neurogenesis in the literature. But I also believe the 5-HT2 receptors are very involved. Antagonism of the 5-HT2C uh, receptor reduces neurogenesis by 63% in the dente gyrus. Um, and antagonism and agonism of the 5-HT1B receptor had no effect, but um, uh, the, the serotonin inhibitor PCPA, which reduces serotonin activity in the brain, its reduction on neurogenesis can be inhibited by, uh, by the uh, uh, agonism of 5-HT1B. So, I mean, this is not very relevant, but the important thing to notice here is that 5-HT1A agonism dramatically increases neurogenesis in the dente gyrus of rodents, and 5-HT1, the 5-HT2C antagonism dramatically reduces neurogenesis in the dente gyrus. Now, talking about the subventricular zone, there are only two areas that, uh, so the subventricular zone, this, here's my notes, 5-HT1A agonism increases neurogenesis by 56% in the subventricular zone. Uh, whereas the 5-HT1B agonism, which remember in the last one did nothing, but it, it just protected it from, you know, but in this one, it increases it by 22% in the subventricular zone. The 5-HT2A and 5-HT2C receptors are agonized both by a molecule called DOI, which is the original molecule used to agonize them, similar to how psilocybin agonizes both of them. So, and LSD. So, Agonizing both of them, the 2A and the 2C receptors, by DOI increased neurogenesis by 24%. And then an additional, more selective agonism of the 5-HT2C uh, receptor by the compound RO600175, that increased neurogenesis by 56%, showing the potential of the 5-HT2C receptor and in general the 1A, 1B, 2A and 2C in the subventricular zone. So what we know really conclusively is that the 5-HT1A receptor and the 5-HT2C receptor are, are conclusively in rodents associated with strong increases in neurogenesis, agonizing them. What naturally agonizes them? Serotonin. But other things agonize them too. As I mentioned, for example, psil psilocybin and, and LSD. And there are other things also that agonize them as well. Um, so that's a little summary there. I also wanted to mention... You, you, I've mentioned before, but exercise increases neurogenesis. It increases neurogenesis via, uh, we've talked about this before, but it increases neurogenesis via the 5-HT3 receptors, which I haven't mentioned yet. It has also been shown that agonizing the 5-HT3 receptors also increases neurogenesis independent of exercise, which is an important thing to know because a lot of people talk about exercise's role in the brain and uh, maintaining brain function. You can do that directly by agonizing the 5-HT3 receptors. Finally, I wanted to mention that just briefly, I wanted to mention, and I've mentioned this before, but you know, remember there were a lot of hypotheses of depression. There's a serotonin hypothesis of depression, inflammatory cytokine hypothesis of depression. There's also a neurogenesis de hypothesis of depression, which was first postulated in 2000. Basically, what it uh, asserts is that there is a... It, it comes from this uh, observation that tricyclic antidepressants... Uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors and SSRIs are very effective uh, at reducing depressive symptoms and that SSRIs are the most effective with the least side effects and they only directly work on serotonin. Not only that, but the interesting thing is that they don't have an acute effect. So the reduction of depression occurs usually about three months into treatment, between three to six months. That is also when neurogenesis starts to really increase in the brain. So that's what built this hypothesis, that depression may be linked to reduced neuroplasticity in the brain due to reduced neurogenesis, and that uh, pharmacologic interventions work in the, the ones that work in the long term. You, know, you can make yourself feel better with some MDMA, but it doesn't work in the long term. These work in the long term. 
And the way they appear to do that is not by increasing serotonergic activity, but by the consequent increase in neurogenesis due to increasing serotonergic activity. And why is that thought to happen? Because think of it this way. When your brain is not plastic, meaning when your brain is, uh, and there's a great book on the subject I always tell people to read, it's called uh, The Brain That Changes Itself by uh, Deutsch, I think his name is. So anyway, when, when, you, when your brain is not plastic, what happens is your brain is rigid, say. Say you have an experience that affects you, like you get divorced, God forbid, or something uh, really harmful to your life. When that happens to you, your brain should adapt to that. It should reconfigure itself to get past that. But if your brain is static and not dynamic, really plasticity confuses things. Think of it as static or dynamic. When your brain is static, it can't get past that. It needs growth factors to be able to realign itself. And that's how people end up ruminating a lot. Rumination means thinking a lot about something, pondering something after it happens, after a traumatic event happens to someone or something like that. If you notice, children can often get past traumatic events. Children have a very high amount of growth factors in their brain. They can get over things quickly. They have fluid brains, dynamic brains, not fluid. We have, as adults, often, not all of us, but many of us, I mean, in general, we have less, <laughs> less dynamic brains, but some people have more dynamic brains than others, which may be why some people get less depressed from life events than others. Of course, there could be many other reasons, but this is one of the hypotheses. And in support of this, it's shown that in non-human primates, which is the closest we can get to studying humans sometimes, and the antidepressant effect uh, of SSRI certainly depends on, on the neurogenesis. And also that in, um, for example, when you knock out the 5-HT1A receptor, SSRIs do not cause an antidepressive effect after around a few months. So that's gone. So it seems to depend somewhat strongly on the 5-HT1A receptor. Although obviously it could depend on the 5-HT2C and A receptors as well and the 5-HT3 and maybe other receptors also. So I hope you guys found this interesting. Basically this is the crux of the reason I use an SSRI. To keep my brain flexible and dynamic and to increase growth factors. It's my staple in my uh, program for myself personally in increasing growth factors of the brain because it's, it's reliable, it's uh, tested, it's been studied for extended periods, it seems relatively safe, although we'll get into more about that in a future video, and it works. I know it works. I felt the difference, I can tell, I know it works. There are other things that work too. There are many compounds, many of them I recommend to clients to try out, I try them out. None have been for me as effective as SSRIs, especially at a very high dose, unfortunately there are at a higher dose, it starts to be, the serotonergic effect starts to become create brain fog and make one sleepy and work less efficiently and, and so on. But it's sort of a sacrifice one makes because you're creating a lot of growth factors. So you have one has to find a balance. But essentially, that's that's uh, the reason I use SSRIs and the reason and that's what motivated my whole fascination with the serotonin system. So I hope this was helpful for you guys and maybe even inspirational. You might get interested in improving your serotonin as well. We'll continue our discussion in the next video about something I haven't decided yet, but it'll be something else. See you soon.